when it comes to um, overall implications um, on clinical practice and guidelines, um, do you anticipate that new tolerability endpoints will be incorporated in the future clinical guidelines or regulatory assessment for CML therapies at all? Um, when we talk about tolerability, we talk, of course, about classical adverse events. Mm-hmm. Adverse events are can be disease-related in the beginning, in the starting phase of the therapy. This should be separated from drug-induced um, adverse events, the real side effects of the drugs. And we talked a lot after the development of, uh, during the development of imatinib about management of side effects. I think that's not in focus anymore because we can switch now and we should switch the therapy when we see major side effects and when we want to avoid long-term side effects. For instance, with nilotinib. With nilotinib, um, the aim of using nilotinib was to achieve treatment-free remission. If this is not achieved after five years of therapy, we should switch because in the long term, we have a major risk of cardiovascular side effects. And this should be foreseen uh, and implemented in our treatment scheme. That means we should know the potential side effects of of all the drugs. Uh, In case of tazatinib, it's plural effusions. And uh, we should ask the patients for daily events, for daily side effects as well, which impair the quality of life. That means all these either long-term major side effects, also low-level daily side effects are important for the management and uh, should be considered in our strategy. And that's, of course, feasible in all countries which have many drugs available and should be used in these countries, in countries where only a limited resources are available. Of course, imatinib is still a very good drug, but we need to manage then the side effects as we did 25 years ago when imatinib was introduced as the only ATP competing uh, TKI. Mm. What what are the the main questions that remain in this field that you're you're looking forward to exploring? We see in Um, CML patients at diagnosis, but also in the course of the disease, additional mutations in other genes outside of PCR-ABLE. That's an interesting phenomenon because that's molecular evolution. The cell is not dependent on BCR-ABLE only. The growth of the cells may depend on alternative pathways as well. And the most important gene here is ACXL1. And um, we and others, um, also the Australian colleagues, have uh, done large cohorts, uh, sequenced large cohorts of CML patients at diagnosis. And we have seen in about 8 to 10 percent of the patients A6L1 mutations at diagnosis. And um, actually, the likelihood to achieve a good molecular response uh, is lower when these uh, um, mutations are there. But also, and that's Australian data, the likelihood to uh, get a BCRAB mutation on asiminib, the myristulcide mutation, is higher. Uh, That means we have a problem here. We have a cohort of patients who may not optimally benefit from the monotherapy with asiminib. Therefore, we plan, and you ask for the future, of course, therefore we plan uh, combination trials with asiminib combined with a multi-kinase inhibitor uh, to overcome this disadvantage. I think that's an important step for the future. This may apply only to a minority of, of our patients. That means most patients can be treated with the monotherapy, with uh, um, asiminib, but we need to address this, and this will be the next step.